All right, it's 3 p.m. and I want to talk to you a little bit about regulations. Um, and in order to figure out what do people actually think about regulations, I asked, well, who do you think? AI, not, of course. <laughs> so I asked AI, what does regulation actually mean? What is, that, what is the first thing that comes to artificial mind uh, when you, you hear regulations? This is what it thought of. So apparently it's more like a conference meeting or something like that. Uh, you're sitting around a table with pen and paper and trying to make some, yeah, well, solving a problem or something like that, right? But if you look carefully, you can see, let's see here. Oh, you can't. The guy in the, uh, in, in the middle on the right end of it, can you see? That lady with the beard? Okay. So it, it's politically correct regulation. But when, when you ask a question like this, of course, you don't get only one image. You get four. This was the least weird one. So here's another one. Now what the heck is this? And what does it tell us about regulations? Well, I wish I knew, because I don't. And why is that guy in there? Well, anyway, so AI cannot help us with regulations, but AI, of course, is, is relevant for regulations because the government is trying to regulate AI quite a bit. And, of course, they're using AI to regulate also what we know and what we understand and the information that we have, right? But what do people actually believe about regulations? Well, they have some cert certain beliefs, and you probably um, experience this when talking to people about regulations, and I'm guessing that most of you have argued for abolishing some regulation. And then you have come across these views. For instance, that, well, regulations, they're there to overcome inefficiencies in the economy. So anyone who is sort of an economist would, would make this claim, right? That with regulations, you can overcome the problems in, in the marketplace. And of course, there are market failures. So leaving it to people themselves to trade with each other, that obviously that can't work. So this, the government needs to step in because politicians can make it work for them. So solving market failures is another argument for regulations. Uh, a third one would be to solve the public goods problem. And public goods, of course, those goods that are not rivalrous and, and so forth, right? So like uh, uh, radio waves, for instance, and TV broadcasting the way it was before. You can't really restrict who consumes it, so why would you produce it? So there will be underproduction, and therefore the government needs to step in and either take over it or subsidize it, because the market can't figure it out itself. And, of course, you have the biggest problem is that in the marketplace, people are greedy, and I think you all recall a couple of years ago, or the, the past couple of years, We've learned that inflation is due to greed, and regulation can, of course, solve this problem as it can solve any problem. But these are beliefs, right? The, the question is, okay, what are the misconceptions of people that actually have more than beliefs, so have some sort of knowledge about regulations? Well, the misconceptions are on both sides of the equation, in a sense. That's why you have the seesaw there. One is the effectiveness, that you're assuming very often when you're arguing for a regulation, that look at this, the problem, it's right there, it's apparent, you can see it. If we could just regulate, that would be a solution to the problem, right? But then you're assuming that the regulation is perfect, that the regulation is the solution, and you're not really seeing the problem with it. So you're committing the nirvana fallacy, as Harold Demsetz put it that you're comparing the real world with something that you assume is just perfect, which is sort of not fair, right? And uh, one response to this is Ronald Coase's question, well, what about government failure? If, if the, the market fails, then government steps in and solves it. But well, what about government failure? Isn't that there's such a thing as well? There's public choice, for instance, interest groups and bidding for politicians and special interests and so forth. And of course, there are unintended consequences, and they're typically ignored or overlooked or 
or it's toned down, that sort of thing. On the other side, market solutions are usually overlooked completely. And in the previous talk, we talked about private policing and, and so forth. Well, that doesn't exist today, but could the market provide police services? Yeah, of course it could. What would that look like? So the, the correct uh, trade-off is not between a faulty present and a perfect regulated economy, but it's between a faulty present, a faulty regulated economy, and a market solution, which I'm not saying is perfect, but should also be part of the equation, right? So this is basically where economists are today. But how would you study uh, regulations in a real and scientific scholarly way to actually figure out what is going on? Well, obviously you can start with Frederic Bastiat and his famous story about the seen and the unseen. And well, you can see here, you can read the whole thing. I'm not going to read it to you. But he's talking about how the, the the good economist is not the person looking just at the immediate effects, but looking also at the long-term effects of it. And typically, a regulation will cause a good effect right now, or at least promise a good effect, but will cause big problems later on, and maybe lasting problems. So if you're focusing only on the short term, you're not going to see the, the actual cost of it. So you need both the seen and what he referred to as the unseen, both sides. And then you look at, OK, what, what is the proper balance and should we, how should we act uh, with this? Of course, you said that the true economist pursues not only both sides, but a great good to come. He looks at, well, maybe it should hurt a little bit right now, much like going to the gym or working out in order to improve your health and you will have a longer and more and healthier life. Well, you need that little pain right now to get the good is, good is later on. And it says that this great good to come at the risk of the present evil. That's where economists should focus um, their study, and that's where we should focus our study as well. So the question then is, how do we study this great good to come? Well, there are a couple of things necessary. First, you need proper economic understanding. And I'm going to assume that you have that now, since you're students at Mises U, and you've already done, gone through a couple of days. So, you already know this. You know how the market works. You know economic forces. You should know, but I'm not sure anyone has, has uh, mentioned it explicitly yet, but that the market is a cumulative and evolutionary process, that it, it evolves or unfolds over time. And we should also know that the driving force, as Dr. McCaffrey talked about, in the economy is entrepreneurship and innovation the creation of something new and much more valuable that then replaces the old uh, in, a, in a process of creative destruction, to use Schumpeter's uh, known phrase. The other side, of course, is that we need a proper understanding of regulations, because we just saw that regulations, well, the way they're usually understood is that they are the solution, and they're very low cost, because it's the government, and very high benefit, which is usually not true. OK. so. I'm going to start with the regulations then. How do we understand regulations? And this is how I would draw regulation rather than the, the weird things that the AI produced as you saw, saw earlier. So if we look at regulations, what is it exactly? What is a regulation? And I'm talking about government regulations, not market institutions. And we have to ask, how does it affect human action? Because that's where economic theory begins, right? With man acts. Act, action is purposeful behavior. OK, so how does a regulation affect that purposeful behavior? When and how does the regulation apply? What are the consequences? What are the effects? How does the regulation affect people's value scales and therefore their choices and so forth? Those hold uh, the key to understanding regulations, OK? And then, of course, what is the economic impact? Uh, what is the effect on, for our purposes, production? What is the effect on entrepreneurship? What is the effect on e economic calculation and the whole market process and the direction of it, if you will, and, and the speed of it, too? And remember, the market is a cumulative process. What, what do I mean by that, that the market is a cumulative process? Well, every choice we make makes possible 
new choices. But every choice we make has a cost, right? An opportunity cost. So every choice we make, we choose to not do all these other things, whatever they might be. We know this. When we go to the store and we have a certain number of dollars, or even better, gold or Bitcoin, we would buy certain things, but not other things. Right? So we buy those things because we can afford them, but we don't buy the other things. So we choose not to, and there, there are the cost of what we're buying. The same is true in, in production, right? That a producer uses resources in order to produce certain goods and services, to invest in certain lines of production and so forth, and not others. Right? It's that calculation that the entrepreneur uh, does every day pretty much, but especially before starting the business and investing in production. So all of those decisions, if they're wrong, usually they go out of business pretty quickly. If they're right, they may, might end up earning a profit and they create goods that are more valuable for consumers. But that means if they had a couple of choices, have different materials, say different types of production, whatever it might be, they choose this, which means they do not choose that. So there's no investment over there. But that's not it, right? That's not all of it. Because one choice leads to another choice, leads to another choice. And if I'm investing in this thing over here and developing this new technology, others can use that technology and build off of that. And I can too. So that leads to more stuff, which leads to more, which leads to more. And let's see how far I went with this. I have, I have way too much hand, time on my hands, obviously. But you see, there's a tree, right? And every decision, you take one fork of the road and not the, you know, don't go the other way. Which means a regulation will tell you that you can't go there. But you can go the other way. Well, if, what if I wanted to go there? There's a loss involved, right? And we're going to have a different outcome completely. So the problem here, of course, is that the forks on the road are unknown. When you regulate, you don't really know what people will innovate in the future. Right? You don't know exactly what entrepreneurs are going to do in 10 years just because you imposed this regulation on the economy. So even if the regulation does not cause a change right now, it might hinder entrepreneurs in the future. Right? You just can't tell. And entrepreneurs always try to imagine how to best serve consumers because that's where the profit is. Right? That's how they create most value. Okay, so if there are regulations involved, well, that takes some options out of the calculation, out of the... Um, out of the equation. You can't choose those anymore, so you pick something else which might be of lesser value. And of course, entrepreneurs, they look around and see what have others done, and they build off of those ideas and what was successful. They can copy, but copy, if I copy what is already being done, I'm gonna compete with the people who are already doing it. Also, when I'm done and can offer my product, they might have already improved theirs. So I should, uh, look at what is being done, but build off of that and add my own sort of flavor to it. So in this case, what if you would impose a regulation here? This is the GDP um, growth uh, throughout the past, what is that, 2,000 years. Nothing really happened, and then you had the great divergence where suddenly the West took off, something happened. Well, you could have said, you know what? Everybody should have a minimum wage or whatever. Well, then you would have taken a different path. You would have different types of businesses and so forth. OK, so am I just saying then that regulations are destructive? Not really. So let's look at destruction. How are regulations different from destruction? And I'm, I'm sure you know what destruction means. Oh, we're in serious trouble. <laughs> OK, so destruction means you destroy something. You completely, well, whatever. OK, so you destroy something. That's not good, right? So let's, just, let's make just a hypothetical example. A tornado comes to Auburn. And it's not now, so don't worry. It's just after the lecture. OK, so it, it, it causes a lot of property damage in Auburn. So plenty of buildings and cars are, are lifted and thrown into the ocean, and I don't know what. All this stuff happens. People, they crawl into their shelters, um, which means they're not from Oklahoma, because in Oklahoma, they will walk, go out and look at the tornado. <laughs> but So no one is actually harmed personally. 
So only capital, only things and property is harmed. Okay? So you have plenty of damage, but no people. Now, when the tornado passes, or it just disappears, as they usually tend, tend to do, then people crawl out of their shelters, and they start rebuilding, right? Because you don't, shoot, I don't have a house anymore. Well, what are you going to do? Well, sit around, wait for the government, or start building a house. You start building a house, right? You, and you work. You don't really care that it's a 40-hour work week because you need a freaking house. So you're going to be very active and try to replace that house as quickly as possible and work really hard to do that, right? This is what Paul Krugman uh, calls economic growth. <laughs> Just to give you a, well, whatever. OK, so what does this mean then? Well, what it means is that in Auburn, everybody's starting to buy different types of materials and construction materials and tools and hire people and try to replace whatever they had before. Maybe they were not going to build exactly the house they had before, but they're going to improve on it a little bit. But they need a house, so they're going to build that. Well, that means that the price of those things shoots up, which, of course, means that well, whoever is in Opelika and they were unharmed, they are going to say, hey, I got a bunch of materials right here. I'm going to just ship them to Auburn and charge double price and make a nice profit, right? So you're going to see an inflow of goods because the prices are higher. And you're going to see an outflow of goods from other areas that were unaffected because the need is greater here, so people are willing to pay a whole lot more for it, right? And of course, businesses are going to see this too. So they're going to go, hmm. I'm going to produce a whole lot of more of this stuff because people will need it in Auburn. They might give it away, but, but they also see a chance for profit. Right? So whoever is producing nails, maybe they will start importing more nails. Maybe they will produce more nails and just ask people to work overtime to have all those nails available when people are rebuilding their houses, that sort of thing. Right? Well, we all know this. This, this is how the market works. We would expect this, greater profit opportunity, more production. right? That sort of thing is redistribution of, of resources from certain places to where they do more good, where there is more profit, right? There's also going to be, of course, disaster relief by uh, private people, by churches and so forth. So people are going to come here and offer more goods and offer help and, and whatever. whatever. Um, the government might even get involved. Sometimes the government actually shows up before everything has been taken care of. Uh, so they might help too. <laughs> and, but the, the point here is that Auburn residents, they've suffered a loss. But how, do, how does that change how the market works? Well, it doesn't, because they're still making these free choices, and they're pursuing the highest value on their value scale, right? So yes, yesterday I had a house, so I, wasn't, I didn't want to build one. I wanted to have one, sure. But I already had one, so I was pursuing some other end. Today, I don't have a house anymore, but that's higher on my value scale, so I'm going to drop everything else. I'm not going to upgrade my car or whatever. Instead, I'm going to build a house because it's higher on my value scale. So we're still going to pursue the, the most bang for the buck, right? That's still the case, even though we're set back. So we have, yes, we have suffered a little bit. So there is a, this temporary setback. We've lost all those uh, buildings and cars and whatever else in Auburn. But we can still uh, act the way we would otherwise act. So we're still pursuing the highest uh, on our value scales, so that it's not already satisfied. Right? Does that make sense? So that's destruction. It sucks, but it's temporary. And it doesn't really change how the marketplace works. It doesn't really change. I mean, it changes the actual outcome, because now we're going to get new houses instead of whatever. But we are still going to pursue the highest value that we can. Okay. The question then, of course, is how is regulation different? Or is it? Thank you. No. no. <laughs> OK, so how, how is regulation different? So let's look at regulation. What is it to begin with? Well, it is a, an imposed cost on certain actions. So it's a prohibition of certain actions. You can't do this, says daddy government. Right? That's usually what happens. Um, 
It could be different types of mandates that, well, in order to cut people's hair, you need a license first. Because unless you have uh, a thousand years in class, or sorry, a thousand hours in class, and pay a certain fees and have these two tests and get a passing grade, it's way too dangerous for society if you cut people's hair. That's the way it works in Oklahoma. So, so maybe, so that, I mean, that, that stops some people from doing it, right? But all these are imposed on people's uh, options, if you will. Okay, so there, but there are also two different types of regulations, right? One type that I call effective, which I know in the literature means something else, but effective in the sense that they actually, it actually has an effect on the economy. So if you would impose a minimum wage law saying that everybody in a paid uh, job needs to be paid at least one cent an hour, that's not going to have much of an effect at all, right? Because I think most people are paid more than one cent an hour. So it's not going to change anything. But if you would say at least one cent, well, let's not go there, at least $100 an hour, that's going to cost quite a big of a difference, right? That's going to cause a, a change in the economy. Why? Because most people don't make that much, right? So that's going to change things up a bit. And that would be an effective regulation because it has a big effect on the economy. The ineffective one does not have an effect at all. It's just inconsequential. Right? So you can have regulations. Government can regulate and have all these laws saying that Martians are not, not allowed uh, to land their spacecraft in Auburn. Yeah, okay. Go ahead with that law. I mean, you can, it, so far, as far as we know, that has not caused any changes. Okay? Now, my claim is that regulations are not destruction as we talked about just a minute ago with the tornado, but destructive, and that this is different. So let's look at an example just to get you on board with the whole cumulative uh, aspect of this. So let's assume that the government imposes a touchscreen ban and that they do so in 2006. And I know this is ancient history for a lot of you, but it's actually pretty recent. Okay, so. This is when touchscreens were becoming a thing and being introduced and put in all kinds of devices all over the place, right? Okay, so what does that mean? You cannot use touchscreens anymore because then you will be thrown in jail or, or sent to Mexico or something. Not Cancun, the other Mexico. Okay, so what happens now to all these consumers who wanted to buy these goods with a a touch screen, well, they cannot. They're not allowed, right? So no one is allowed to sell it, no one is allowed to buy it. Which means if this is, would be my value scale, that I really need a uh, portable music playing device. And those are the, my different options, or those are the options available in the marketplace. A portable radio, you might not even know what that is, but whatever. A Walkman to play cassette tapes or maybe even CDs, the modern ones, and then the iPod Touch, which has a touch screen. Just... Well, if there's no regulation like this, then of course I would just buy the one with the touch screen on it, the iPod Touch, because that's highest on my value scale, right? And the economy produces all three, let's say, so I'll just buy whatever is of the highest value for me. After the touch screen ban, I can't get the iPod Touch, so I lose that option, right? And instead, I will go for the second highest on my value scale. It doesn't mean that it's impossible, or there is a, it's a product that no one has ever developed or can't develop or anything like that. No, that they were there, or they could have been there. They're just not there anymore, so I have to pick something of lower value, right? Well, there's a, an implication here. It is not that I lose this option once and then, whoop, yeah, whatever, because that's still on my value scale, right? I would still, every time I listen to music and I have my Walkman and I bring my CDs, I would still prefer to have the iPod Touch, right? So every time, I'm going to go, like, oh, imagine if I had had this thing instead. So every time there is a loss in usage, and every time I would have wanted to buy and upgrade uh, the Walkman, there is also a loss because I can't get the value up here, the iPod Touch, I can only get the Walkman down here, okay? 
that option is lost, but the option, every time I would have I ex exercised that option, I have that cost, I have that loss, right? Okay, which means I can no longer pursue my highest valued possible end because that has been taken away from me by someone else, okay? Of course, this is not a, a static economy as, as we talked about, so this has consequences in the long term as well. And if we look at the production side and not the consumption side, then we'll see that, well, producers are not allowed to sell touch screens anymore. And that's why I can't buy a touch screen or part of it, the reason anyway. Okay, so what will producers do? Any touch screen producer, any, any producer of goods that uses touch screens, what will they say? They'll go, darn it. I'll just stop everything I'm doing and I won't do anything more. And everybody else goes, oh man, those resources look nice, but they were intended to touch, for touch screen production, so we'll just keep them there just in case. No, of course not. So maybe those businesses will go out of business, or maybe they will just start doing something else, right? So because they can no longer produce the iPod touch and whatever else there might be, they will instead produce something else. That's the whole trade-off, right? That's, that makes sense. The problem here is that these entrepreneurs would have thought that, well, something with a touch screen would uh, satisfy consumers more, there would be more value here, but instead I'm producing this other thing because that's the highest value I'm allowed to produce. I could produce this higher value, I'm just not allowed, which of course means underproduction of the higher value and relative overproduction of the lower value. Now that kind of sucks, doesn't it? Okay, well what this means is that the whole production structure is distorted, right? Because anything that would have had a touch screen, that would have used a touch screen, will no longer see an investment, and those values will not be realized anymore. Instead, you will have investments elsewhere, so you will have increased productivity and increased production of goods that are of lesser value. Correct? 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 Okay, he's on board. So, so if I'm wrong, it's his fault. All right, so actually there should be no, no big surprises so far, right? Because this is fairly straightforward analysis, right? So this, any regulation will distort the production structure. Um, it will cause value losses. Any effective regulation will cause the outcome of the market, of market production to be of lesser value because entrepreneurs will just pursue something that they think is of lesser value. This is the seen and the unseen, right? So nothing strange going on. Now I want to introduce what I call the unrealized which is an addition to the seen and the unseen. Now remember what we said about the market uh, and economy and the market process being cumulative. Well, because it's cumulative, okay? And that means that, yes, entrepreneurs look at what other entrepreneurs are doing and they're taking those ideas and they're combining them perhaps in different ways. They're adding their own competencies and their own thoughts and ideas to them and producing something new. It also means that the producer of a certain thing will continue to update and improve what they're producing, right? So in this case, uh, this timeline is for Apple, as you might see. Okay, so the iPod production of that led eventually to the production of the iPhone, taking the similar ideas but expanding them and putting other goods into it, right? That sort of thing, which led to producing the iPad, which is basically an iPhone without phone capabilities but it's stretched out a little bit, okay? And then, well, that's where we're at today, right? There's several generations of these things, but we don't know what is the next thing that they would innovate. But you can see that they build off of each other, right? And that's between companies as well. So it's, it's not only within the company. Okay, so this is the, what cumulative means. Now, what are the implications then of the touchscreen ban. Well, we wouldn't, wouldn't have this continued investment in any of these products using touchscreens, of course. That would not happen. Uh, 
any consumer wants that would be satisfied by goods using touch screens or any goods that would follow from the experience of using touch screen types of goods. Say maybe there's a, a, uh, a type of device that doesn't actually have a screen, but the technology was developed based off of the touch screen technology. Well, we wouldn't see that either because how would we get there, right? It was stopped in its tracks. Uh, it also means that all those competencies involved and all this knowledge that was developed in this process will never come to be. Because how would you know how to produce a really, uh, a really advanced and efficient touch screen or other type of, say, projection technology that would, would, would arise due to producing these things if you ne actually never produce these things? So that wouldn't happen. It would also mean that diff jobs would not be created here, right? So you wouldn't have anything called a touch screen engineer. I don't know if that is a thing, but let's say it is a thing. That would never happen. Uh, maybe Apple would not uh, be a big firm uh, as it is today. Some, someone else would be producing something. Maybe Sony would be really big with a new type of Walkman. And we would all be playing CDs still. Who knows? I mean, we don't really know what would happen, right? Uh, but the types of jobs that, were, that are developed in line with this type of innovation would never happen for the simple reason that we stopped this development in its tracks by outlawing, prohibiting touch screens. Okay, well instead of course these investments will be made elsewhere so we would have different jobs in other industries. And isn't that a good thing? Well, jobs are good I guess, right? But from the perspective of the economist, we're producing things of lesser value and we're developing competencies and jobs and careers and education of future uh, uh, workforce in these competencies that are, are expected to produce lesser value than we otherwise would have produced. That's not necessarily a boon, right? That's something bad. So yes, there will be growth there too, but it will be lower. Okay, so it also means that any business that is supplying things and that is, that is in any of, the, of these successful innovations, you have plenty of businesses that are started and they're supplying special services to these businesses and they're supporting it in supply chains and what have you. All of these things, just the packaging of the iPad, say. There's pe people specializing in this, both in, in the design of it and the materials used and all this stuff. Wouldn't happen either. All of those things will instead happen somewhere else where it is expected by entrepreneurs that they will be of lesser value. Okay, so this means that we have a different thing to talk about here, right? So this is an issue long term that is not the seen or the unseen. It's not the immediate trade off, it is rather the direction of the whole market process, right? So it unfolds not in this direction where it would have otherwise but instead it unfolds in this direction where the investments are made. Lower value, right? But it also means, of course, that other people get other products than over here. It's just that the market values those uh, at a lower level. Okay, so we're gonna get different types of jobs, we're gonna get different businesses, we're gonna get different everything, pretty much. Okay, so the whole market economy would then, structurally speaking, be in a different place and would be heading in a different direction because of this one regulation. This is this strange hypothetical society where everything is a free market except for this ban on, on touch screens, right? So all those options that would have been available are not available anymore. Instead, there are other options that are necessarily of lower value that will be available, which means, of course, that the whole economy is on a lower trajectory, right? So you think of the economy as, as a process that moves in a certain direction towards value creation, because entrepreneurs, they make money off of creating value for consumers, right? So we're taking off and we're following that path. Some, some entrepreneurs are weeded out because they don't do very well and they, they got a wrong idea and whatever. Some are successful and their ideas are what the economy and other entrepreneurs are building on. And that's where the jobs are created in line with value. Well, with this regulation, now nah, we're not gonna have that. 
Instead, we're going in this direction, which of course is of lower value because otherwise entrepreneurs would have chosen it anyway, right? And then we're going to have this cumulative process in that direction instead. So it's going to be lower value, less prosperity for people in general. Different people are going to be rich, of course, than otherwise, but they're going to be less rich, most likely, at least overall speaking. So what is the effect then? The effect of this is on entrepreneurs themselves is that they can't pursue what they thought was most valuable, which would be typically, we would think of it as the most profitable goods. But of course, many entrepreneurs start businesses that are not only in line with the greatest profit, but also with where they think that they will make a difference. Right? So it's not only about profit itself, it's about social change and caring for the poor and whatever else it might be that entrepreneurs are pursuing. If there is a regulation in place that makes that impossible, they're going to have to do something else. Maybe some other entrepreneur will have to do it instead. Okay? So they can't do what they thought was best for the economy and therefore for themselves. Uh, they cannot make these investments with a higher rate of return, however you choose to uh, measure the rate of return. Instead, they, they or someone else will invest elsewhere, right? which will facilitate then the next generation entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs to invest based off of whatever happens instead. Right? That's the problem that policymakers have with regulations all the time. They stop this, but they're not telling entrepreneurs what they should do instead because they can't figure that out, of course. So they will get something else instead, but what? Well, we don't know. That's why we have unintended consequences. And the whole economy will build off of this unintended consequence and, and sort of continue down that road instead. Well, you can see where this is going, right? One little regulation, well, that could affect the whole damn marketplace, the whole economy. So if the whole economy is on a slightly lower trajectory, remember the graph from before? Slightly lower trajectory, that might mean, might mean the death of millions of people. It might mean that we're all really poor, which of course, without regulations, compared to that, we are really poor. Okay, so this also means then, of course, that we all get a, low, very, a lower standard of living overall, and we can satisfy different ones than we otherwise would have been able to, and different ones than we would have, been, would have wanted to satisfy. So yes, this means fewer and worse options for consumers, which means just goods and services, that's what we think about immediately as economists. But that's not all, and that's not the most important thing either, right? Because it also means jobs. The jobs are going to be created where the investments are, not where the investments didn't take place, right? So the new jobs, the new careers, the new knowledge generated, all of this stuff is going to be elsewhere, and it's not going to be aligned with where the greatest consumer value is. It's going to be aligned with the second highest, if there's one regulation, the third highest, if there are two, and so forth, right? If those regulations are effective, of course, that is. Okay, so to sum up then, and this is the, the book that I wrote on, on this concept, um, to sum up, any regulation has a long-term effect on the economy, its trajectory, and what is developed, what is uh, created and how it is created, by whom it's created, what jobs are created, what incomes people earn because they're creating lesser value, so the incomes are going to be lower, right? All of this are caused by regulation. Okay, so it's, yes, we can call it just misaligned production structure. It's a very dry way of saying that we're screwed. <laughs> okay, but the effects on, on our general well being and prosperity. It's much, much greater than we usually think of, right? Because if you just look at the seen and the unseen, well then, yes, you will see costs of it, but you're never measuring the, the trajectory of the economy. You're never measuring, well, what is the actual cost of investing in Walkmans instead of iPod touches? How would we know? Well, we can't know, of course, but we can guess. Let's say in a society where there are plenty of regulations, maybe we would be on a really low trajectory compared to where we otherwise would be. And then 
well, you can, you can yourself go and uh, uh, count the number of regulations that might have an effect on the economy in our society today and how long they have been there in place. And then you can think about, hmm, I wonder if this might affect one entrepreneur's actions. And if it does, it will put us on a lower trajectory. And then just count them together and see, hmm, I wonder if we're losing anything. The answer would be, hell, yes. <laughs> okay. So what I want you to think about and the sort of takeaway from this is that, yeah, destruction is bad. Krugman would say it's not, but destruction is bad, but it's not nearly as bad as regulating. Because the effects of regulation, they're destructive over and over and over again, and the error is cemented because of the investments elsewhere, right? We're on a different trajectory, doing different things in different ways, producing different types of goods. And it's not the case that if we just abolish this regulation over here, then all the entrepreneurs are going to go, oh, shoot, look at that. And they're just going to shut down their factories over here and instead start producing this. No, because you can't roll back time. The market process is cumulative. It builds off of what is. So if you abolish the regulations, yeah, that's going to be better, but you're going to have a different result than if you'd never had a regulation. Okay? So destruction is, comparatively speaking, it's awesome. Okay, and one way of phrasing this is, of course, that even libertarians have no freaking clue how destructive regulations are. Because if you think about them in this way, which is basically just following human action and what is the effect of, of prohibiting a certain option that actors might have, producers or consumers, well, you know, then you get to this conclusion and you realize that, holy smokes, this is really, really destructive and this forces us to be poor for just a few more millennia, that sort of thing, okay? So even, even libertarians arguing against regulation, they don't quite get how really bad it is, okay? So that's the takeaway. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. I'm gonna leave you with just a list of my books. Self-promotion, thank you, I'll take your questions. Your thoughts on regulations pertaining to the environment? Same as any regulation. Uh, why would it be different? I mean, I, I understand the question. I mean, my, my answer was sort of tongue in cheek. But it, it, it is the same for the simple reason that most of the destruction of the environment is due to government uh, accepting it, approving of it, or even subsidizing it and the lack of property rights, right? So if the alternative is a, a completely free market and a free society, then environmental protections wouldn't be a thing, really. And you would have tort law. So if it would affect your property, you would just sue the, the balls off of that person, right? So it, it's not a big issue. Uh, it's a big issue today because the state created it. Uh, what do you think about regulations of like self-destructive behavior? Like, would people maybe be better off if the government said, "Oh, you can't uh, smoke crack or whatever"? Or these things that maybe people think they'll be better off if they do them, but in hindsight, they're actually not. So, I think any question that begins with "What do you think a regulation of?" I think you know the answer, <laughs> right after this lecture. Um, but in, in that, I, I think there's a. a big scope for anything non-governmental. So I think the family has a role. I think churches and voluntary organizations have roles. I think market standards have roles, all of this stuff. I don't think the government should step in and say that you can't do this. Because that's a very blunt tool, right? And in all of those self-destructive behavior, I mean, it's, a, it, it's really circumstantial. And it's not something that uh, a few hundred idiots on, on Capitol Hill can make, just write it down a rule and then that's it, solves the problem, right? It's gonna cause a lot of other problems. And of course, it, it opens up for public choice problems too, right? That, oh, well, let's, we should regulate self-destructive self behavior. Then you're gonna have a, a 
interest groups popping up like mushrooms everywhere, and they're going to start lobbying the politicians, right? And they're going to end up with some crazy regulation and really rich lobbyists and that sort of thing. So it, it, it opens a Pandora's box of problems.